Welcome to South Hills Corona. My name is Adam, this is my wife Gretchen, and we are the campus pastors here. And we are so excited that you decided to join us for church today. We realize though that like, not everybody goes to church sure. every single Sunday, and maybe you've never been to this type of church before. And so we just wanna show you what to expect from your experience with us here today. If you didn't already grab it on your way in, we do have complimentary coffee on the plaza. And if you brought your kids with you, I highly encourage you to check out our kids' classes for all ages. They have so many fun games and lessons and singing and craft. And all of our kids' facilities have been updated and remodeled yes. in the last couple of years. So even if you don't have kids, you should just sneak over and check take a peek because they're amazing. You should also know that there is no assigned seating. Okay, <laughs> so you can literally sit wherever you want to. And right now in our setup, we have rows, we've got chairs, mm -hmm. couches, love seats, tables, plus outside of the auditorium, you can also sit in the lobby where we live stream the service in our cafe. We have a mother's room in case you have a little one that you think might be fussy during service. And there's also seating outdoors as well. We'll begin the service with a time of worship and we hope that you'll sing along. And there's no need to have all the words memorized. We will definitely have them on the screen. Our band is amazing and very energetic and they can also get pretty loud and yeah. so if it's a little too loud for you just so you know there are earplugs available in the lobby if you need them when worship is over we will be out to let you know a couple events and activities coming up around the corner that we'd love for you to be a part of and then someone will be out to share a teaching from the bible and they're going to talk about it in a way that is relevant to what is going on in your life so that hopefully you can take something from it and apply it into your every day right now. And I would encourage you to get something out to take notes with because you might want to remember something later on that you learned and it's okay to laugh because we love to have fun. Then we'll close out our service with a brief time of prayer together. We're gonna to give an opportunity to give for anybody who wants to and maybe even tell you some stories about how your giving is impacting our community and even rippling out all the way around the world. Absolutely. And then that's it. We hope that it is an hour that you enjoy, that you look back on and are excited about and you look forward to next week as well. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thank enjoy you. the service.
Good morning, South Hills. How are we doing? We are back inside. Would you stand with us? Would you worship with us this morning? Come on. Hands up. Let's sing this out today. Come on. We sing when night has fallen. When night has fallen, when fear is calming, still you're calling me, Jesus. When faith is lost and my hope exhausted, you will be my straight. When my mind, when my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. Yes, I've decided I'm not giving up. Cause you won't give up on me. You won't give up on me. Love is holding on and it won't let go.
best is yet to come on oh, the cross before me my hope on mission today. Sing out to God. As much as he sings on to you, sing out to him your praises. Sometimes we cry out. In some, in some seasons you gotta just celebrate, right? Come on, come on church. Just sing out to him. Oh Jesus, cause you're worthy of my highest praise, Lord. Cause you're worthy, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing, King. What you're gonna do, yes, Jesus. Cause we worship, and we worship, King, yes.
other wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty. You are holy, holy. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. The universe declares your majesty.
today we just stand in awe of you and your majesty and your power and your goodness and, and your bigness. That this entire world, this entire universe fits in the palm of your hand and yet here we are worrying about all of these things that ultimately we don't have control over but you do. You know what's coming next. You are not surprised by anything that is gonna happen in our lives or in this world. And we look to you, God, for that source of peace, that source of just awe. Thank you, God. And we forget so easy, and I, I pray today, God, that we would go out from here and we would not forget. We would not forget how in control you are and how, how big and masterful and powerful you are, how good you are to us. How in every small and big thing you are at work, God. And we ask this in your name. Bless this service. Amen. Thank you guys so much for worshiping with us today. You can take a seat. Welcome to South Hills. My name is Nate. I'm the family pastor around here, and I am so glad that you're joining with us today. Whether you're watching online or here in person, I hope that you experience something meaningful and helpful to you in your life. Well, if you are new here, I want to invite you to fill out our Connect card. Let us know a little bit about yourself and how we can connect with you and help you along. You can text the word, what's next? all one word to 94000, or there is a link in the video description, or you can head to our Instagram account. There's a link there. It is basically a lot of different places that you are. Find that link, fill it out. And if you've been around here a while and you would like more information about some of the things that you've heard, that is also your best way to connect with us as we try to help you take steps in your faith journey. Well, we've got a great message for you today, but before that, I wanna let you know about a few things happening around here at this campus. Discover has been this reinvented thing that we've done for those that are trying to find out about who we are as a church. We had it originally scheduled for today, but we're postponing it to after Easter in just a little bit. So stay tuned for details about that. Also, team night is happening next weekend on the 20th of March in the afternoon at 4 p.m. This is a special night to celebrate and have fun, uh, some special little food and snacks for anybody and everybody that is volunteering or looking to volunteer as a part of any of our teams here on this campus. So, mark your calendars, join us on March 20th next weekend for this incredible night called Team Night. Also, our groups have launched in this spring, and we would love, if you haven't yet connected to one of these, to do that still right now this week. There is lots of opportunities, so head on to the Church Center app, go to the link on our website, southhills.org corona, or come find us at the Connect Counter. We would love to help you connect relationally with somebody in your life so you can grow spiritually. Well, before the message today, take a look at this little spotlight from our senior pastor, Moses Camacho. South Hills, one of our locations is Santa Clarita, and today I have our campus pastor from Santa Clarita, Pastor Efren, and I asked him to be here today because I wanted him to share a great story that happened at his campus, and I wanted you to hear it from him. Thank you, Moses. We had a family who was watching us online just prior to the Christmas season, uh, and they were kind of trekking along with us, you know, catching the, the series, and kind of texted me and wrote to me and said, hey, you've been watching, following along, and just recently decided to to make their way into the church physically. I decided to come out and experience the service in person and they were just blown away. It was just a different level being able to kind of connect with people one-on-one, -on -one, feel and experience the welcoming environment that we work hard to create at South Hills and was just blown away by the worship and the message. You cannot wait to come back again and That's experience awesome. it again. Well, South Hills, I hope that you heard the story here of how you can ultimately extend an invite to a friend of yours and have them watch it online, see it for the first time, and then at some point they're gonna take the next step and walk through the doors and get to see the full experience and have a great connection with our community and our church by what we get to do through our South Hill services. Everybody wants to be happy. But so few seem to be. We're convinced the feeling we're searching for can be found in buying or achieving or experiencing something a bit bigger and better than we currently have. So why isn't it working? 
Why are so many of us miserable? What are we missing? Don't you wish you knew how to be happy? Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. And um, man, last week, uh, for those of you, how many of you were at this time slot last week? Um, so we uh, owe you some money for therapy bills. Um, we had uh, we had a little fire that broke out on the, the corner of our stage last week, and uh, it was a motor that overheated and melted an extension cord that caught a patch of carpet, and um, we were able to put it out quickly, and we did some outdoor services, and uh, uh, we, in order to get back in the building, of course, there was this massive laundry list of things that we had to do uh, to make repairs, to deep clean and uh, abate the, the surfaces and the air in this facility, get electrical equipment back up and working, all that sort of stuff. And uh, it happened, and we're here this week because our team worked uh, around the clock to make it happen. And before we jump in today, I just want to recognize a couple people specifically. One um, is our tech director, Christian, um, who just had to re-cable the, the whole stage and had to clean out things and retune and recalibrate all the instrumentation and uh, work on so many different things to make it happen. Also, if you were here, you saw him like as soon as it happened, he like leapt up on stage and like peeled off his coat and he was like to reveal the S on his chest and he was like beating the fire out and um, he's just in a lot of ways, he really, he really is a, a superhero um, to me and um, has made it possible for us to be in here and not just in person, but broadcasting today. And, um, and I'm, I'm super grateful for him. And uh, the other person is our, our family pastor, our chief of staff, um, Pastor Nate, um, did so much this week to organize cleaning crews and to meet with the city and to meet with the fire department and to make sure that the things got done that we needed to do and um, made it all happen. And I would say probably each of these guys put in about over 80 hours each this week to make sure that you uh, had a place to come in and worship today in a clean air and with everything working. And so would you guys do me a huge favor and just show those guys some uh, appreciation. We, we really do just have a phenomenal uh, team here at South Hills, and you were lucky that you go to church here, just to let you know, okay? Um, well, today uh, we are going to continue on in this series that we started last week called How to Be Happy, uh, which is about exactly what it sounds like, right? This thing that we, that we want, it feels elusive, we, we, we want to be happy, we're not really sure how to be happy, and so we just decided to take some time to talk about, like, what is happiness even? And how does it work? And how do we tap into it? And what does God have to say about it? And so uh, that's where we started last week. And uh, if you missed last week um, or you just couldn't hear out on the lawn because the birds liked chirping really loud, um, we uploaded I re-recorded it. We uploaded it. And it's online for you to catch up to. But today will make sense even if you didn't listen to that. And uh, I want to encourage you to take some notes, write some things down, take a picture of two of the slides. Um, because it's not just hearing this message, but being able to take it home with you and put it into practice that is actually going to make a difference in your story. And uh, if you are taking notes, the title of my message today is Secret Chalupas. See, one person is real excited. Secret Chalupas, which also just sounds like a fun password, right? Like if you're going to start, if somebody's thinking about starting a club, make the password Secret Chalupas. Because it'll just make me, it's just fun to say. Um, what's the password? Secret Chalupas. Let them come in. Let them come in. So I, there was this thing that happened to me, uh, it was like my freshman-ish year of, it all blurs together, in college, and um, there's this girl that I was dating back home before I came to college, and did anybody else do this thing? You had a high school sweetheart, right? And you were just like, we're going to be together forever. This distance won't come between us. And then a month in, you're like, I was deluded, right? This is not going to work out. And um, I, it just... I knew I needed to call and or have a, a hard conversation, and I was like, you know, seven hours away where I went to school, and I was dreading it because I liked her, and I didn't want to hurt her feelings, and I felt bad, and my family liked her, and our families liked each other, and she was really cool, but it was just like, it, this was not 
the, the relationship for me. And I had talked to my roommate about it, and I'm like, I'm going to do it. And I kept doing this thing where I would be like, I'm going to do it. But then, like, I, I didn't want to have the confrontation because it would make me feel sick to my stomach. And so I kept, like, putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. No one here has ever done this before, right? Um, and so one, one, he finally pinned me down. He's like, you're going to do it. This is, the, this is the day. And I'm like, this is the day. And I was like, Whew. as soon as I get off work, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to drive straight home. And I'm gonna I'm gonna call her, and it's that's what's it's that's what's gonna be. We're gonna do it. And um and I got off work, and I I I knew it was coming, and I started feeling so sick to my stomach. And instead of coming back to our apartment, I I went to Taco Bell is what I did, and I went to the drive-through of Taco Bell. And it was right around the time, I mean, some of you, chalupas have been around forever. This was not always a menu item. And I was really excited about it. And they had, like, this special. And I was just like, man, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to do this. I'm nervous about it. And you know what will fix the, like, the angst inside of me? Chalupa Fest. And, and so I, I, I pulled in. And you know, they always have those, like, packs of just, like, 45 burritos for $20. And you're like, who buys that? This guy. This guy buys those deals. Uh, he buys family packs, and then they're just like, enjoy with your family. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, family. And it's just me in my car, right? So I got like a 12-pack of chalupas, which I'm eating in my car and thinking about the fact that I need to call this girl, but I don't want to. And I'm kind of like half crying a little bit and eating chalupas and driving. There's a lot going on. Probably listening to like really sad Radiohead. It's, it was a lot, you guys. There's a lot happening. I pull up, I get, I crush out these 12, and they're big, okay? I think this is actual size. Like, they're huge. And I ate all these chalupas. I felt totally sick at, right at, like, immediately afterwards. I'm like, you ever in the middle of something, you're just like, this is a huge mistake. You know what I mean? Like, you're in the middle of it, and you're already regretting the thing that you're still in the process of. It doesn't even make any sense. And yet... There's cheese baked on the crust, so I just kept going, right? I'm like, I'm not a quitter, America, and I just kept doing it, and I ate all these, and, like, and I went inside, and I like just collapsed, right, because I'm so exhausted, and I wake up in the morning, and my roommate is standing over my bed, and he looks so angry, and he's like, did you call her? And I was like, yeah, man, <laughs> and he's like, did you really call her, or did you just go to Taco Bell? And I was like, what? That's crazy. And in my head, I'm like, I'm like looking around for signs. I'm like, how does he even know this? He's like, did you seriously, don't lie to me, man. Did you call her and work this thing out? Or did you just go to, you know, Taco Bell and order 12 chalupas and eat them in your car while you were crying? And now I'm like, now this is sounding really suspicious. Like, how does he even pick out? But I'm, I'm telling myself, 12 is a common number, right? It's like a dozen. It's how many disciples there are. Maybe he just pulled it out of the air and it's happenstance. And I'm like, no. And then he's just like, you're lying to me. And he pulls his hand from out behind his back. He has all the wrappers from the floorboard of my car and he just throws them at me. And I'm like, ah, and it's like raining ch chalupa, you know, wrappers. And I'm like, I failed. And he's just like, you need to call her today. And he's like, do you feel better? And I'm like, I feel dirty. You know what I mean? It was wrong. It was not great. You know what I mean? I, I did try to do this thing, and it just it backfired. And I still had to call her. And it still sucked, you guys. It was still horrible. She cried real hard. And I did not feel proud of myself. And I might have gotten chalupas that day, too. And so I don't want to talk about it. And I bring this up because we, I think we all have these moments, right? And what do you tell yourself when something goes sideways in your life, and then it's not going great, and so you do something to make yourself feel better? Uh, I always tell myself, like, man, I know this isn't the best thing for me, but I deserve it. I deserve it because it's been a hard day, okay? It's been a hard season. It's been a hard two and a half years, however back I need to go, right? I just, I can justify it. And I think this is our rationale a lot of times, right? It's not bad to do something bad to feel good when things are, aren't going good. You ever told yourself this before? I know this is bad, but here's the thing, self. It's not bad to do something bad to feel good when things aren't going good. And why do we do this? Because it kind of works. I mean, temporarily, right? It works. Because if it wasn't enjoyable on some level, we wouldn't do it at all. But the consequence of these sorts of moments are that some forms of pleasure that are enjoyable in the moment seem to make us even unhappier in the long run. And often we sit in the aftermath of pursuing pleasure and ending up less happy and being confused because a lot of times we conflate the two things. We equate happiness and pleasure, but they're not the same thing at all. 
In fact, I want to just give you a working definition of both these things so that you can sort of peel them apart in your own mind. Pleasure is essentially a, a momentary spike of physical or emotional enjoyment, right? It is short-term it's often something that is addictive, and it's usually self-focused, right? Uh, it primarily, if you're talking about brain chemistry, works on dopamine, that thing that's just like, that was enjoyable and exciting. We should try that again, right? And you find yourself going back to that thing over and over again to get that little hit. Happiness is something else altogether. Happiness is this, as we talked about last week, this overall sense of holistic satisfaction with your life. It's long-term, not short-term. It's additive, not addictive. And it's relationally focused or communally focused, not self-focused. And it works on the brain chemical serotonin. It's that chemical that gets released in your brain that sort of makes you feel connected and at peace and um, makes you feel like a part of something bigger than yourself. Those things are the things that we often identify as happiness. So these things are not the same thing. And in fact, one can sometimes get in the way of the other. Like, this is, this is, this is the, 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 even before we can go further, I, sh, I just need to say, like, pleasure is not bad, okay? Um, in fact, God created it. He created you for it, and he wants you to experience it. Um, and so we need to start there. But the problem is pursuing pleasure uh, to the extent that it sabotages our happiness. And that is something that God is not for. Um, but we all know people who do this, right? We all know people who are experiencing a lot of pleasure. They're doing all the things they could ever want to do, and they are not happy because it's not the same thing. And usually our reaction in the middle of that moment when it's us who's pursuing pleasure but not experiencing happiness is we're just like, why isn't, I know what it is, I just need to do more, right? <laughs> How much are 13 chalupas, you know what I mean? And we just like, we go all into the thing. We're like, I need to do more of it, more often of it. Maybe that's the thing that's off. And whatever that thing is for you, because it's not the same thing for all of us, but maybe it's at the top of your mind. If you don't know it, the person next to you probably does, right? Don't say it out loud or nudge them, it's going to get weird, right? But we all have something, right? Some of us, you know, we, when we're in that desperate place, we eat, we, we rely on shopping or drinking or smoking or binge watching or playing video games forever or just scrolling on our phone for 17 hours, right? Whatever that thing is for you that you try and do to feel happy. And yet there's regret often on the back end of it because we know it's not good for us. It's just pleasure devoid of happiness. And all the things that are bad for us aren't bad for all of us in the same way for the same reasons. And so when we're combing over our life, sometimes it takes a little bit to sort out why this thing isn't working for us at this given moment. Um, some things are unhealthy for us uh, just categorically, right? It's just something that is inherently self-destructive. Like we lean into it to try and feel a little bit better, but it's just, it's not a great thing overall, right? It's like something doesn't go right, and so we commit aggravated assault. Not good, right? That is categorically, it's just never right, right? We're just like, I'm unhappy, I'm going to go to a prostitute, right? Like that's not a good thing, okay? These things are inherently self-destructive in this category. But not everything that's bad for us is bad for that reason. Some things aren't bad categorically. They're just bad excessively, right? They're bad because it's too much of a good thing, right? One chalupa, arguably okay, right? Um, if you're talking to my trainer, never okay. But, like, I'm going to say one, right? But when you're, like, binging on this thing, it's too much, right? A little bit of sugar, great. A lot of sugar, too much. Like, one Netflix show after work, maybe great. Uh, three straight days when you're supposed to be doing something else, not okay, right? And yet we, we can move into things where the issue with it is that we're, we're overusing it, right? Um, but not everything is, is unhealthy because categorically or excessively, sometimes it's, it's unhealthy contextually, right? It's just not appropriate for the time, place, or season that you're in, right? It's by itself, it's probably fine, but under these circumstances, it's not. And we probably all have that friend who's like, they just are really active and energetic and they, like, they wanted to go out like four nights a week, you know, and just dance and hang out. And it was pretty innocent. And that was great when they were single. And now that they've got seven children at home, right? It's like four nights, maybe a lot, okay? I don't know. I think maybe you're avoiding your, your kids um, and they don't even know they have seven, right? And you're like, that's a, that's a warning sign. That's not good, okay? Maybe throttle it back just a little bit. 
But I would say, like, whatever category it falls in and whatever it, it is for you, whatever, like, bad thing you do to feel good when things are bad is likely an act of avoidance. It's a way of, of trying to distract yourself from the fact that life is not going the way you want it to. It's likely the, the reality for you is that, like, inside, you know, you, you feel discouraged or disappointed or hurt or stuck or lost, but you don't know how to deal with that. And so what a lot of us do is we pursue external pleasure to avoid addressing existential panic. Right? We don't want to have to actually sit with our feelings and analyze what we're doing and, and why things aren't going well and actually have to face some of those issues. And so we're just like, what can I do to feel good right now? And sometimes we do these things because of a specific incident, and sometimes we just do it because of general disappointment. Right? Sometimes you eat like a whole carton of Ben and Jerry's late at night because it was just a horrible day at work or with the kids. And sometimes you do that same thing. Everything is fine with the kids, but you've just been unhappy in your marriage for a while. It's not a specific incident. It's just the sort of the state of things that you're not really sure what to do. And here's why that doesn't work, because it never ends up addressing the underlying issue. It just numbs you momentarily, and usually in a way that takes you further away from the kind of person that you actually want to be, that you're made to be. And that's why it makes us unhappier. Because here's the reality, and if you take nothing else away, I hope you grab hold of this this morning. Unhappiness is a byproduct of who you are being out of alignment with how you live. Having a sense that this is who I am, this is who God made me to be, this is what God has called me to, and yet I, I, I believe that, but I don't really behave that way. And even when we're not consciously aware of it, we can feel that there is this misalignment inside of us, and it throws us off. Life doesn't feel right. And maybe you're thinking like, man, if I was just more spiritual, I wouldn't struggle with this. You know, and that's an interesting thought. I mean, it's not true. Uh, in fact, I would say probably one of the most spiritual people who's ever existed, this guy who wrote the majority of the New Testament, right, uh, the Apostle Paul, he talks about at length like struggling with this same exact thing of feeling unhappy because like who he really is isn't consistent at all times with how he chooses to live. Let me just read you exactly what he says. It's in Romans uh, chapter 7, verse 15, he says, I don't really understand myself. For what I want to do is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. You've been there, right? It is, it is maddening. Like, we've all had these moments where we find ourselves sort of caught in this cycle of coping that isn't exactly working, and it's making you feel like less of who you really are in the process. You end up feeling worse about you and about it, and you don't know how to stop. And this is one of the, the worst places to find yourself in life because it is a happiness drape. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I want to spend the rest of our time sort of painting a picture of like how this sort of thing can happen and how quickly it can spiral and really how destructive it can be. It doesn't sound like a fun time. Um, and I, I want to go to this uh, story in this Old Testament that begins with a really interesting prophecy. God making a promise to a woman who's desperate to get pregnant. And, and this is what it says. It's in the book of Judges, which is in the Old Testament. And it says this. This is like the voice of God talking. He says that you, you're gonna, you will become pregnant and you'll give birth to a son, and his hair must never be cut, for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He'll begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. And when her son was born, she named him Samson, and the Lord blessed him as he grew. So a mom is promised a miracle baby who is going to grow up and save an entire nation. No pressure, right? Right? Like, I wonder how it felt to grow up with the hopes of an entire people group stacked on your shoulders. 
Like, in addition to that, he was a Nazarite, which is, you know, this expansive set of sort of as a spiritual order, which had all these rules and regulations to it. One was you couldn't cut your hair. One was that you could, like, never touch dead bodies. And it went on and on. And some of you are like, that's a deal breaker, okay? I love touching dead bodies, okay? So not for me, right? But there are all these rules that really kept you focused on, on serving God and prioritizing who God was. And he had to grow up, like, living in this specific way that he didn't really choose. It was kind of chosen for him, which would have felt like a lot too. And yet, as he grows up, it's evident that God is with him, that God has blessed him, that he has like, you know, some manner of natural giftedness and that like he's gotten some early success. And of course, that just builds people's expectations of him even higher and higher that he's going to be able to do incredible things. And when I think about that, I just think like that is a lot to put on a little boy. And I wonder, I wonder if you've ever had what felt like the hopes of someone else sitting on your shoulders. Maybe for you it was a parent or it was your whole family or it was a team or it was an entire organization. And the reality of the situation was they needed you. They were depending on you. They were counting on you. So you better not screw up. That's a lot. And some of us grew up feeling that way. And I wonder if if Samson ever felt like he had to always be on, like he could never have a day off, like he'd never let his guard down, like he could never show weakness, like he always had to have all of the answers to everything, like he had to live up at every possible moment to this prophecy that was made about him before he was even born. And, And I tell you this because I think some of us develop unhealthy coping mechanisms because things are going really bad. And others of us, we develop these things because of the pressure to always be good. Like for some of us, it's just like, man, things are tanking in my life. And for those of us, it's like, I can never, ever, ever admit what's really going on with me. And I don't know how to handle that. I don't know if I can do what's expected. I don't know if I can carry the weight. Now, now, I want to back up for a minute because maybe some of you are like, what is a coping mechanism? Because you keep saying that, that phrase, and we don't know what that means. And uh, essentially, a coping mechanism is anything people do to try and alleviate suffering, stress, or sadness, right? And this could be a good thing or a bad thing. It could be a helpful thing or not or a, a healthy thing or not. Um, we all have these things, and they're not all bad. Um, Like, for instance, let me give you an example of one in each category. Let's say, for instance, that you had, uh, like, just the the worst day ever, right? And and sort of at the end of the day, you're just like, this was the most stressful day ever. And so that's why I had to, like, just go home and, like, put on sweatpants and, like, breathe deeply. And I just, I prayed and I did some journaling about what's going on inside of me. And then I, I, I went for a run and I was just trying to sort of calm myself down. Now, let's say you had the exact same day. That would be one way of coping. You're the exact same day, and you're just like, man, this was a very stressful day, which is why I drained my kid's college fund, bought heroin under a bridge, and shot up in an abandoned car, right? That's maybe not so great, okay? Both of them uh, coping mechanisms. One maybe a little bit darker, a little bit unhealthier than the other one. And I can only judge by your silence that many of you have done this. Well, not responding really backfired for you guys there. Right? Like, like, there's a big difference between these two things. And as Samson's story progresses, Samson starts to show signs that, you know, he's starting to crack under the pressure. And he grasps for ways to cope. And the methods that he uses go from bad to, like, even worse. And he basically just sort of pursues anything that he thinks is going to make him feel better in the moment. And if it doesn't work out for him or it doesn't come easy to him, he sort of flips out. He demands his own way and he, you know, he copes in even more destructive ways. And I want to just, like, this is a big story, but I want to just give you a couple of drop-in moments to show you what I'm talking about to to illustrate this. And you can go and read this story all afternoon if you'd like to, to get the rest of it. Judges chapter 14, verse 1 says this. One day when Samson was in Timnah, one of the Philistine women caught his eye And when he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye. I want to marry her. Get her for me. 
What a bold thing to do, right? Can you imagine if one of your kids came home and was like, she's pretty, get her for me, right? And you'd just be like, it ain't going to happen, buddy, right? It's crazy, right? This is a little bit of a crazy story. Like, Samson is convinced that this girl, by the way, he has never spoken to her, doesn't know anything about her other than he saw her from a distance, and she appeared to be hot, right? And he's like, if I can marry her, I will be happy. Meanwhile, she doesn't love him, and she's, a, you know, a Philistine, and so her family is all trying to kill him. So a few red flags, okay, in this relationship that he really wants to pr- pursue. But he doesn't care. He just wants what he wants. He demands it. In fact, he tells himself, I deserve it because my life is hard, because there's a lot of weight on my shoulders, because there's a lot of expectations on my back, because I have to do things that I did not choose for myself, and it's difficult. So this, this thing is okay, and it's a horrible idea, but his parents are, you know, they're definitely enablers, and so they just go get this girl for him. They set up the marriage, and the wedding starts to happen, and there's this elaborate exchange in which her family embarrasses him and sort of entrap him in this weird way through, like, tricks and lying, and now he owes them money, and he's really frustrated, and he's, like, embarrassed and sort of emasculated, and so this is his, like, really proportionate, like, making sense response. Judges chapter 14, verse 19 says this. He went down to the town of Ashkelon, killed 30 men, took their belongings, and gave their clothing to the men he owed. Samson was furious about what had happened, like what they did, how they embarrassed him. And so he went back home to live with his father and mother. It kind of peters out at the end, right? Are you like me and you sort of read that and you're just like, he showed them. Oh, you got him, Samson. Nothing says in your face you shouldn't mess with me. Like I am I'm going, I'm going home to mom. And that's what he does. He, like, literally moves. He doesn't go back to the wedding. He does not go back and get his wife. She's just there by herself, dancing, eating cake by herself. He's at home pouting, sulking, ruminating, being more and more angry with his mom. She's probably baking him cookies. And then later on, he's just like, you know what? I probably should go see what my wife is doing. Um... And this is like a season later. It's like harvest time. So it's like quite some time later. And it says this, Judges chapter 15, verse 1, says this. Later on, Samson took a young goat as a present to his wife, as you do. And he said, I'm going into my wife's room to sleep with her, as you do. (laughs) But her father wouldn't let him. I truly thought you must hate her. I wonder why he thought that. Because you disappeared for six months. And so I, obviously this is logical too, I gave her in marriage to your best man. And then Samson said, this time I cannot be blamed for everything I'm going to do to you. And so he attacked the Philistines with great fury, and he killed many of them. And then he went to live in a cave. Is this the most, like, like immature, overreactionary stuff you can think of? Have you ever done this, though? Have you ever done the thing where, like, someone does something, and you're just not happy, and you don't like it, and you're just like, well, that is it. If you're going to do that, you know what? I cannot be held responsible for what I'm going to do, which is not true. It's just saying, like, I don't want to be held responsible for what I'm going to do, but I'm going to try and do it anyway and blame you for my poor decisions, right? And there's so much going on here. Like, Samson's story is so expansive, but the reason I, I wanted to highlight these three snippets is that I think it's enough to to get to zero in on this pattern that he repeats over and over and over again in his life. And it's it's essentially this. He gets into a situation where he feels overwhelmed, and so he responds by coping with something unhealthy. And then uh, if anyone calls him out on it or gets in his way, he angrily overreacts, and he freaks out on them. Then, after that happens, he has a little bit of regret, and so he isolates in shame and anger, and then while he's by himself, right, he's ruminating on everything that happened, and he spirals further, and then he repeats the cycle from his cave. Like, when you look at this, is there anything that feels familiar about it? I point this out because this is what I wonder. What if this is less about Samson and more just about what it is to be human. I wonder if you are honest with yourself, if this is like a little bit your pattern. Like we love to look back through the hallways of history and say like, man, they were crazy. (laughs) They did some weird stuff, right? And it's like, I mean, if you distill it down to its essence, like we do some weird stuff. These are often the choices that we make. 
And isn't this cycle, this thing that you do with whatever unhealthy thing that you are coping with in the moment, isn't the fact that you are stuck in this thing, isn't that a big part of why you are not happy? Because you are coping in unhelpful ways. You're doing things to try and feel better that are really just making everything worse. There's this uh, other verse in the New Testament by the same guy who said the other thing, right? I mean, I'm telling you, he really wrote a lot of the New Testament. And he writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. He's like, listen, you say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is beneficial. Right? Sometimes you can even, like, even though you're making excuses, you can sort of sense that that thing is not a great thing for you. Maybe it's like categorically, Right? Maybe just like because like you're doing it excessively, and maybe it's whatever the other one was that I can't remember right now. No, I'm just kidding. But we find ourselves in this same sort of cycle as he did. And I wonder if like the coping mechanism that you know is robbing you of your happiness. I wonder if you find yourself rationalizing in the same way. Like, it's not that big a deal. It's not technically wrong. It's not illegal. I mean, not in this state. You know what I mean? Like, it's, I can do it if I want to. And here's the reality. You can. You can do what you want to. But everything has a cost. And I wonder what it's costing you. And I wonder if that thing is some level of happiness and wholeness. There's this other line from the same exact guy. He writes this other letter to the Galatians. And um, to the church there, he says this. He says, you were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Now, th- this, this word flesh is like a churchy term that basically means your natural animalistic drive for self-gratification, okay? And essentially what he is saying here is, come on, like, when you got to that place where you realized you had agency and you could kind of do whatever you wanted to, it was tempting to take it too far, wasn't it? And you probably did, because most of us do. That's what we do. It's a very human thing. We chase whatever we think is going to make us happy in the moment, and then we end up being trapped by it. And then he switched gears and says, like, but here's the thing. Here's the good news. Like, there is an anecdote to self-destructive coping. And it has a lot to do with service, humility, that grow from love. Now, I want to break down what, what these ideas mean. Because if this is a possible anecdote to what we, the loops we find ourselves in, then, then how do we do them and what do they actually represent? What is humility? I think humility looks like vulnerably admitting to a safe circle of people around you what's really going on with you. There's this, um, there's this quote that gets thrown around a lot in AA that, is, that goes, you are only as sick as your secrets, right? It's this idea that, like, you are never going to get better. You're never going to get out of the loop. You cannot save yourself. Uh, like, it's not until you begin to come to grips and admit to yourself and the people around you that, like, I'm in over my head that I need help. I have a weakness. Things are not going right. This is how I'm really feeling, how I'm really doing. These are the things that I've been doing that I don't want to tell you. These are the ways I've been coping. And Samson doesn't ever really do this. He numbs out. He acts out. He hides in caves. Not super productive or helpful. In fact, they just help him spiral further. And I'm telling you, this is important to underscore because having the right community around you prevents you from indulging in things that will destroy you. Which is why we isolate when we just want to keep doing what we're doing that isn't even working. But we need the thing that Samson never really put around him, people that will listen to us and validate us and encourage us and build us up and challenge us and help us develop healthier habits. And then, of course, in this passage, we're, we're told to lean into service. And what does that mean? Service looks like straining to see through someone else's eyes and sacrificing 
to improve their situation. Oftentimes, like in a, in a clinical setting, a counselor will suggest to someone who is suffering from anxiety or depression to take some baby steps to find a way to serve someone else on a regular basis. And why do they do that? Because lasting sadness is connected to prolonged self-focus, right? In, in other words, like the more you obsess over your own happiness, the more it eludes you. And Samson is a really good example of this. Like he's so preoccupied with what he wants and what he thinks he deserves and how he's feeling and what's not working out for him in the moment that there's no room for him to really consider or care about other people. He occasionally does things that help other people, but when you read through his story, it's mostly by accident. Like he's mostly just doing what he wants to do, and then it was like, oh, that kind of like bonus helped them. You guys are welcome, right? And yet he destroyed a lot of other people in the process. And this happens because when we're uh, overwhelmed with emotion, we do the same thing he does. We, we, we try and make things better in ways that make them worse. But I got to tell you, emotion is not the problem because emotions are just information. Right? It's how you respond to them that determines the direction your life moves in. And it makes me think of something else that um, the Apostle Paul again writes in a totally different location, right? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, he says this, Don't sin by letting anger control you. Now, this is relevant because obviously you can look at Samson's life. He does a lot of really crazy things and hurts and kills a lot of people. He's angry. He's a rageaholic. He's very violent. And so, like, he would do good to, like, lean into this thing. But what this is essentially telling us is that, like, in this, in this setting, like, anger is not the problem. Allowing it to control you and what you do and how you cope is. And I bring this up because I think that this principle is, is still true about virtually every emotional state. And I just wonder this morning, what makes most sense for you to fill in that blank? Maybe it is anger, but maybe it's something else. Maybe for you, maybe for you, the advice looks like, listen, don't sin by letting your disappointment control you. Don't sin by letting your insecurity control you. Don't sin by letting your anxiety or your fear control you. Don't let those things dictate what you do and who you become because you will eventually find yourself coping in ways that take you away from the person that you want to be. And so other than practicing humility and, and service, how do we keep this stuff from controlling us? Well, we cope. And some of you are confused because you're just like, what? I thought you said that was bad. Um, but not all coping is bad. In fact, there are two beneficial types of coping, and we really need both of them. One is what's called action-focused coping, right? And this is about solving a problem, right? This is where we, something's not going right, and we sit down, we try and gain clarity. We brainstorm solutions. We choose one, and we get busy enacting that thing, right? We move forward on that path. Because we're like, man, this thing that is unsettling, that's caused me to feel all these ways, like, it's because there's something that needs to be done, and I need to take those steps to do that thing. And the, the, other, the other type that is another form of healthy coping is uh, emotion-focused coping, right? Which is about solving a problem. Because there are some things that, um, that cannot be fixed or solved by you at this moment. And so this has to do with strategies that we develop to sort of help ourselves deal with an unchangeable situation, right? You may be frustrated about something that you don't really have any control or influence over, and so uh, there's something you're going to need to do to sort of deal with the emotions of that thing because there's not really much action that you can take that would be productive in this situation. Like this is where we might, you know, exercise or connect with a friend or, you know, go and, and get therapy or we may, you know, uh, we pray or breathe or journal or whatever these things might be that help us particularly. But I got to tell you, like, if you want to be happy, you need to do both of these things. And this is why I would suggest to you to lean into relationships that help you do um, and address the thing that you typically ignore, ignore because uh, all of us tend to lean in one direction or the other. And we fill the gaps in the thing that we don't do well with things that are unhealthy and unhelpful. Like some of us are very action-focused. We're like, feelings, what are those, 
right? Like, I'm going to solve this problem. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to make it go forward. Like, we draft a plan, and we move forward, and we just march in, and we're going to do stuff, right? And, and sometimes that really helps because it, there, there actually is something that needs to be done. There is a plan that needs to be made. And yet there's this whole emotional side of us that we completely ignore and we keep stuffing it down and, and, and it keeps trying to come up and we keep trying to ignore it and, and, and it's mutating and it's causing us to do things and say things and become things that are not really us. And others of us, we're the opposite, right? We're like real good at focusing on our emotions. We're like, I feel all the feels all the time. And I just, I, I love processing my emotions and just listening to all the therapy podcasts. And I love, me and my therapist, we're down to just four times a week. And I, I am loving it. And just, I like talking it out and just like, and do it. And then like a good cry. And then I watch a movie about the subject. And then I cry about that and whatever. And it's like, and I feel like I understand where, what, like what's going on. And I, I have that managed. And it's actually, I, you know, I feel like I've wrapped my head around it. It's like, that's so great. Like, what, what action steps are you going to take to, like, like, move this situation forward in your life? Oh, I, I haven't done any of that. I don't, I don't know. I have no clue, right? Because we, we haven't actually, we've dealt with the one side but not the other. And so there's this whole grouping of things. Like, something needs to be done. A decision needs to be made. Steps need to be taken. And yet, we're frozen. And so instead of that, like, the situation deteriorates even further. And I bring this up because I, I really believe that happiness comes from acknowledging and accepting your emotions while acting on your values. To feel those things, to reflect, to acknowledge, to accept them, and then to, to like, don't let those things control you. But to actually choose to live according to the way God made you. Like, happiness comes from doing the right thing over feeling the right way from living in alignment with our values as opposed to medicating according to our moods. And the thing I think is most sad about the Samson story is that he, he never really masters this. And eventually his, his self-destructive coping mechanisms catch up with him and they destroy him. And he died really unhappy because who he was was almost always out of alignment with how he lived. Like, think about it. He, he was destined by God to save Israel, but when he was overwhelmed and, and when life was too much for him and when he had all this stuff bubbling up inside of him that he didn't know what to do with, you know what he never did except for, like, on, with his last breath? He, he never called out to God in prayer. He never looked to scripture for wisdom. He never went to the tabernacle to worship or to give or to talk to a spiritual mentor and gather advice. And instead, he just, he just coped in unhealthy ways, wanting to believe he could still be happy. These things would have helped him. I think they would help you too. And I, I think they're even more abrasive when, when we go back and revisit this verse that we've been bringing up again and again during this series. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. I'll just read you a couple of snippets from this. Don't worry about anything. It said pray about everything. And then you will experience God's peace. And I, I think one of the big flaws for Samson is that Samson tried to access God's peace without God. It doesn't work because you can't get something only God can give from anything other than God. And I want you to think about that because I think in, in your soul, you already know that's true because you have tried it and it does not work. I mean, you're free. You can do whatever you want to do. But everything you do has a cost to you. Like you can stick with the with the secret chalupa strategy. But it's never going to be what you need it to be. Whatever that thing is for you. And I know you were probably trying to do the same thing Samson did. You're trying to hide it, pretend it's not real. Isolate, pull yourself away, not ever want to admit it. I'm telling you, humility and service are the way forward. And those things are only really accessible when we grab hold of the love of God. 
And that's what I want to challenge you to today. I think God put you in this place this morning for some of you because there is something, there is a cycle that you are caught up in and it is robbing you of your happiness and God wants to help you break free. And there is a big piece that he's going to have to do because you've already tried and it doesn't work. But you're going to have to do something too. You're going to have to surrender it. You're going to have to admit it. You're going to have to bring it out in the open. You're going to have to let it go. And you're going to have to move in a different direction. And it is going to be difficult. But your happiness is on the line. And you can't find the kind of peace that God wants to give you without going through him to get it. Would you bow your head across this, this room as we pray? And, and before I do, I just, just for the sake of focus and just respect of other people, if you just close your eyes in this moment, and I want to just ask this question of you. I wonder how many of you would just, on a gut level, just admit to me so that I can pray specifically for you. I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you in any way. You just, you're at a place where you have been trying a lot of different things to try and cope and feel better and fix like the, the broken parts of your life that you don't know how to sort of juggle or handle and you've been avoiding coming to God because there's a little spike of pleasure but it is robbing you of all the happiness and you feel this sense that God is saying like you need to let that go. I want to step in and set you free and, and, and today is the beginning of that journey for you and if that's you, I, I want you just to respond by just raising your hand so I can pray specifically for you today because I, I believe that just the first response of like humility and bringing it out in the open, even just privately to one pastor is the beginning of something new. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up? I gotta tell you because your, your eyes are closed, you're being respectful. It's a lot of people. And as I give voice to our prayers, would you just pray along in your heart that God would help you and the people around you to move in his direction. God, we, um, we come before you this morning and we acknowledge that you are bigger than us, that you are smarter than us, that you created us, that you have the answers that we are searching for that you see every heart in this place. You know the things that we struggle with. You know the, the walls we keep running into in our own life, the things that we keep reaching out for, hoping that like we're going to get enough of a, of a boost of pleasure to stop feeling miserable. And we keep digging the hole deeper. We keep hurting ourselves more. And now there's a ripple effect. Now more people are being affected. Now we, we can't hide it. Now it is, it is, it is unhideable. And it is wreaking havoc in our lives. And we feel trapped because we need you to release us from the bondage that we are in to this thing that told us lies it could not deliver on. And God, I pray that you would begin the process of releasing people and setting them free from coping mechanisms that are sucking the joy from their existence. God, as they lean into you, as they trust you, as they draw up the courage to confess to Christian community around them, as they take baby steps towards better coping mechanisms that rely on you, God, I pray that you would leak into their lives this steady stream of your joy, of your hope, of your peace, and you would begin to heal them from the inside out. May it be true in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. Such a great message, and I know it hits so many of us, it hits at home. And if that's you this morning, if maybe you were one of the people that raised your hands, or maybe in your heart there's something that you want to talk with someone about that you need prayer for, I encourage you every week at every service over to your left, the I Said Yes corner. We have a Bible that we can give you, a reading plan, and just caring hearts that want to encourage you, uplift you, and pray for whatever is going on in your life right now. So I encourage you to take advantage of that today. 
you know, uh, there's so many amazing things going on that God is doing in our church and through our church and our community. And we're so thankful that each one of you gets to play an amazing role in that. And so I want to offer uh, or give you the opportunity to give with us this morning. If this is your church home, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can do that in the towers of the wooden towers on your way out. You can do that online or through the Church Center app. And I'm a big fan of the Church Center app. I love using it for small groups, for, for events, for giving. And one of the things I want to highlight really quick that you can look at all the details for on the Church Center app in the events section is Team Night, which is next Sunday. If you volunteer, if you're interested in volunteering or just want to know what are the different opportunities. It's an amazing night. Come out. We're going to do VIP awards, um, extended worship, lots of fun together. And then also if you take a look at the um, Easter handout on your chair, there's many ways you can get involved in the ne this next season before Easter to um, impact children, families, and those in our community. And so I'd love to have you jump in one of these opportunities. Um, and that's all we have for you today. So thank you for being here. Have a great Sunday, and we will see you back next week.